Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week, we're featuring an interview with Dominika and Aleksandra, two human rights activists in eastern Poland near the Belarus border, who speak about the situation with the migrant route through the Biovesia forest in the midst of increased militarization on both sides of the border, through this ancient forest, and through the region. Both are active in the umbrella group Grupa Granica, or the border group, a movement supporting people on the move. You can learn more from the links in our show notes. In coming weeks, we hope to feature more conversations with activists on the ground in this region, speaking on similar topics, including locals who've seen social and environmental changes as tensions build between neighboring nation states and international alliances, and how it impacts people seeking asylum and engaging their freedom of movement. Okay, would you introduce yourselves for the listeners, maybe, whatever name Mm -hmm. or location that you want to give? Uh, my name is Aleksandra Hrzanowska and uh, I work for the Association for Legal Intervention, which is part of Grupa Granica movement. Uh, and my name is Dominika Orzeńska and uh, I'm part of EGALA Association, also part of Grupa Granica. Can you talk about the, the wider group, the umbrella group, the hmm? border group? Uh, in general, Granica, what, so. yes. So Grupa Granica, which translates to border group, it's a loose collective of different organizations and as well as individuals, activists or members of local community who organize together uh, in response to a humanitarian crisis uh, at Polish-Belarusian border. And they all provide uh, assistance to people on the move who get stuck in the forest here. Can you talk about what the border here looked like to your knowledge before 2021 and how it changed and why? Well, I've never been here personally, so, uh, but, uh, well, I think one misconception is that uh, the, that people on the move started crossing in 2021. I mean, it's not, it's not true, like, uh, men, people used to cross here before, but in 2001, just the numbers increased, right? Uh, but it, it's not that, so, like, when we talk with local communities, they would say that, like, well, some individual cases happened before too. Just it wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, a big deal really. The difference yeah. uh, is that uh, before this humanitarian crisis, this border was very well protected by the uh, Belarusian border guards and the army. Uh, so, so it was really very difficult to to, clo- to, to uh, cross the so-called um, green border, and it it happened very very rarely. Uh, but uh, this border, Polish-Belarusian border, was a natural way uh, for asylum seekers uh, from the former Soviet Union. So uh, for many, many years we've had uh, quite many people from Chechnya, from Tajikistan, people uh, running away from authoritarian regimes, uh, and they were coming to Poland mainly through uh, brest terespol border crossing. Uh, and we also had at that time already uh, some cases of pushbacks. So at the border crossing, people they would la- they would ask for asylum, but the border guards wouldn't let them in, stating that they need visa in order to enter, uh, which is actually against the law because the Polish constitution and the international uh, asylum law says that uh, you don't need to have any documents, uh, and even any passport, yeah, any ID, to enter uh, a safe territory if you ask for asylum. In any other case, uh, you need to have visa, you need to have document that gives you right to enter, uh, but, uh, but not in the case when you apply for asylum. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not precise in the law, it's ju- it just says that if a foreigner enters the territory uh, of a safe country and in contact with the border guards of this country states that wants to apply for asylum, 
then such an application uh, has to be uh, accepted. Uh, and then the migration authorities, they decide whether these people should be granted international protection or not. So, so even before we had uh, quite a lot of cases that people applying for asylum were not accepted uh, at the border crossings, but uh, previously, before, before this humanitarian crisis that started in uh, summertime 2021, uh, we've never had uh, so many crossings through the green border. And this changed because that was the, that was the idea of the uh, Belarusian regime, the idea of Lukashenko, uh, who stated himself that he wants to like, invade Europe with, uh, with migrants. And that was in response uh, to the sanctions against the Belarusian regime the EU sanctions after the falsified uh, presidential elections in Belarus in August 2020. So, so it started more or less in spring 21, and it started on Belarusian-Lithuanian border, and then also in Latvia and Poland. So, so actually Lukashenko's regime, they started to invite people, mainly from the countries where people run away from anyway. Yeah? Uh, we are talking about people from Afghanistan, from Syria, from Yemen. So the information in these countries were, was spread that uh, uh, it's easy to buy Belarusian or Russian visa. Uh, we heard about, uh, about uh, the so-called touristic offices which opened in these countries, uh, encouraging people to, uh, to, to come to Europe. And at the beginning we had really a lot of people here who, who heard that this is legal and safe way to Europe. You buy a Belarusian or Russian visa, then you just need to walk uh, for a couple of hours through the forest and you are in Europe, you are safe. Uh, which, uh, which of course wasn't the case because uh, here on the Polish side, uh, the Polish border guards, they were uh, stopping these people and whether they asked for asylum or not, they, from the beginning, they were pushing them back to Belarus. And this practice of pushbacks, this is an illegal and inhumane practice, uh, forbidden in the European law, but unfortunately um, applied in, in practice. What happens if somebody... Um based on your conversations with people that have crossed the border, what happens if they decide to turn back and go back into Belarus? Wait, well, they, uh, they don't decide to go back to Belarus. Uh, I mean, when they are stopped in, on the Polish side and they are... Or when they get pushed back. Yeah, when, uh, so, so, so actually when they are here in Poland, they usually want to apply for international protection. Uh, but in most of the cases, they are pushed back to Belarus. And then, if they realize that this is a trap, that they don't want to, to, to take this risk anymore, and they want to go back to, to Minsk in Belarus and then to their countries of origin, in most of the cases, they are not uh, led to by, uh, by uh, Belarusian uh, forces. Uh, they usually tell us that uh, that they hear from the Russian border guards or soldiers that once you are here, once you are in this border area, you either manage to go to Poland or you will die here. And we heard a lot about cases when uh, people, well, they, they describe it in a way as if they were punished uh, for, uh, for the fact that they were not effective in crossing the border and that they were pushed back from Poland back to Belarus. Uh, that in such cases they are very severely uh, beaten. Sometimes they, uh, they are forced to dig their own graves. So we, we have like a spectacle of execution. And we hear really of a very, a very different kind of uh, violence, I would say tortures. Uh, people are electrocuted, are chased by dogs. We quite often see the wounds after the dogs bite. Sometimes we hear also about uh, rapes. Mm, the only the only way uh, that that I've heard uh, for people to be able to return to Misk is to pay uh, a really big amounts of money, right? Which they usually don't have at this point because if they try to cross once, 
Um, and they met Polish authorities, uh, either Polish or Belarusian authorities. Very often we hear testimonies that uh, um, they take money from people, that they rob them of their uh, belongings. So um, most often once they're back in this uh, in this part between the Polish fans um, close to the border, which uh, people call Sistema or a death zone, so um, once they're there, after several pushbacks, they usually don't really have money. But uh, uh, yeah, this is almost the only way that we hear that they can get out and go to hospital or, or to get some shelter is to just pay, pay a bribe again. Somebody told me about, um, about a large amount of graves that were found outside of Minsk not that long ago like 250 graves. I don't know if this is something that you had heard before. When I asked about this, they explained that um, this is like likely people that got infections, maybe from dog bites or maybe died of exposure or became sick because they were drinking water in the swamps because they didn't have other alternatives. Maybe you can't comment on that. I can't mm. point to a news story that talks about it. Mm. I've heard this story, but the problem is that we have absolutely no means to verify any of those information with all of the misinformation that's out there. And because, uh, you know, Belarus, it's just such a tight regime and most of the like people working in the topic of human rights already were forced to flee uh, from Belarus themselves, right? Like the Belarusian citizens working in the... Uh, civil society in the regard of human rights, etc. So we don't really uh, have any means to verify any of such information. Um, so it's it's quite hard to, to comment on that. But I mean, for sure, we know that uh, that the number of deaths, uh, like I think so far, recently there was a there was a, a report published, and I think so far. We're talking about roughly 80 confirmed deaths, but we know that the actual number is much higher and that, and we know that it will be, most likely it will never be possible to, to establish the real number of deaths uh, to people that happened either directly in the areas next to the border or like where there is a result of pushbacks and the disease or sickness like closer somewhere to Minsk and uh, just yeah. from, from time to time we hear testimonies from people on the move we meet in the forest that, for example, they were traveling with their family members or with their friends and some of them died on their way, but they cannot uh, indicate the location. Or some of them, they say that uh, uh, somewhere on their way uh, they were passing by and they saw a body, one body or more bodies, yeah? both on Polish and Belarusian side. And it's absolutely impossible to verify, uh, but uh, but uh, we think that there is there. I mean, I can't see why would they invent such stories. Yes, so probably if somebody, uh, because it's not that we can hear it on the everyday basis. Yes, it's from time to time. So so it means that these people, if they say so, it means that they either lost somebody or they uh, really saw. Uh, um, uh, a dead body. So, so this is one type of testimonies, and sometimes they also tell us that they saw like real executions on the Belarusian side, that somebody was beaten to death, or that somebody was in such uh, bad condition uh, because of drinking this uh, dirty water from swamps or just or from hypothermia or just because uh, somebody was exhausted yeah that uh, there are people who were witnesses of somebody dying or being uh, killed uh, this is mostly about the Belarusian side so it's, it's even more difficult to to verify uh, than here um, and on the Polish side uh, there were cases where where we found the bodies uh, or other people from other organizations yeah so. Mm -hmm. And maybe one more thing, because here we are in the primeval forest. Yes, it's it's huge and it's really very old. And usually people who are here, they need to hide because they are afraid of border guards and soldiers uh, who organize manhunts. So if they hide uh, and they are exhausted and they die, uh, they probably hide in places which are really very uh, difficult to access. Uh, there are swamps, 
there are, there, are, there are fallen trees, very old fallen trees. And if you hide in such a place and if you die, it's not a place where anybody would go just like that. Uh, if, if, if we don't get information that maybe somebody uh, stayed here or there, there are plenty of places which will never be checked just like that. And the nature will just absorb uh, such bodies sooner or later. So probably, probably, well, yeah, you cannot estimate the number of people who, who died and, uh, and we will never find out uh, where, when and how many of them. It's a huge topic of the deaths because yeah, the, so this is one aspect of it that that when people are scared and they're hiding, just as Ola said, it, it will be impossible to ever find them. But another like really sad and horrific uh, side of um, of what's happening here is that uh, there were at least two cases where people found uh, were found dead very close to the houses uh, of the nearby villages, and one case uh, right under the like right under uh, uh, the windows of one house and and then recently last year just in the forest that was just like one forest road uh, from the village but it also so sh that also shows how scared are people right that even in this like very extreme conditions um, they still were too scared to go and ask for help uh, when they were so close to, so close to the to the houses and, uh, and people in the village so it sounds like there's there's a legal side of offering people like to to help the process of ap applying for asylum there's like a legal portion of that um are you aware of the sort of stork oh cool. stork <laughs> are you aware of the sort of um activism that people engage in or um human rights accompaniment or whatever that they do towards when they find people in the forest or when they hear that people are coming through the forest, um, how people give aid? Yeah, so we mainly we mainly provide people on the move with the basic humanitarian help. So uh, when we get information that uh, there is a person or a group of people somewhere in the forest, we ask for the precise location and we ask uh, about their individual needs. So like always we take with us water, hot tea, hot soup, uh, uh, some more food. Uh, and then we, we pack the backpack according to what are the individual needs. So clothes, shoes, sometimes sleeping bags, sometimes the raincoats. It, it depends on the weather conditions as well. If we know that uh, that uh, within the group there is somebody who needs uh, medical help, we ask also a paramedic to, to accompany us. If we don't have such information, we just take like the basic uh, medical stuff with us. And we actually, after three years of the crisis, we can all manage with uh, trench foot or... Uh, or, uh, or uh, Wound care. Yeah, like the, the first stage of hypothermia, or uh, or if it's uh, if, if somebody is poisoned after drinking the, the the dirty water. So yes, we pack the backpacks, we go to the forest, we find the group, and uh, then if uh, people tell us that they want to apply for international protection, uh, we explain them uh, how how it looks like. We explain them what is the law, but also we have to tell them that in practice. It might be very difficult because uh, uh, the, the border guards, they don't always observe the law. And so it happens that even if people declare they want to apply for asylum in our presence after signing for us the powers of attorney to represent them in this procedure. So we are kind of witnesses that uh, such a person really <laughs> declared the will to apply for asylum. It still happens that the border guards uh, push such people back. So we have to tell them that we cannot guarantee that this time everything will uh, work as it should work. And then we also inform them about how this procedure looks like, about the risk of being placed in detention center. So, so if people decide to apply for asylum, we help them to fill in 
the, the powers of attorney and the simple declaration and then we inform border guards and they, they come and they take people to the border guards office and then uh, they should start this asylum procedure which sometimes takes place and sometimes doesn't. Um, somebody explained to me that there's two kinds of facilities that people get brought to, open ones and closed ones. Can you talk about the difference and what sort of logic you're aware mm -hmm. of as to when people get placed in one versus the other? Mm -hmm. Well, normally if somebody applies for asylum, uh, they shouldn't be placed in a detention center at all. Uh, but here the practice right now is that if somebody travels without passport or any other ID, then they would be placed in the detention center in order to, uh, to be able to confirm the identity of, of such a person. Uh, so, so people who don't have passports, they are placed in detention centers and those who apply for asylum and they have passports or at least the photos of their passports, they would be rather placed in open facilities. So detention centers are run by border guards and it's, the, these facilities are like prison-like. So you have no right to, to leave, you have uh, uh, limited access to, to, to your phone, to, to internet. You cannot use your own devices, you have like a common computer you can use like, for some time during the day. Uh, yes, and the, I, I think that the, 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 the most difficult for people in this situation is this deprivation of liberty. You know, because these are people who uh, usually haven't committed any crime, they just uh, wanted to apply for asylum. That's why they crossed the border illegally, but the illegal border crossing is not a crime, it's a petty crime. You know? So, so they shouldn't be placed in detention only for that. And the other kind of facilities are open centers for asylum, uh, seekers run by um, uh, the Office for Foreigners and it's kind of a, a shelter uh, where, you can, where you can live and you have access to food there as well and you can, uh, you can, you can go out, you, know? you, can, uh, you can do whatever you want, you just cannot leave it without informing social workers f uh, for more than two days, because if you disappear for more than two days, then they interpret it in a way that you actually left the country and, you, and, they, and they stop your asylum procedure. Yeah? As someone from the US, like when I think about Fortress Europe and I think about the border protections, I know that it's not always Frontex that, for instance, in the Mediterranean crossing or when the Balkan route was a thing that people were coming into contact with. It was sometimes like navies or coast guards for various countries. Why isn't Frontex operating the border and why is the Polish state doing it? I mean, we can only say why we think there's no Frontex. Uh, <laughs> Not to say that Frontex would be great, but... Yeah, you know. exactly. Um, we wouldn't like Frontex no, to operate here. <laughs> also, I mean, let's... Just because the Frontex hasn't been here so far, it doesn't mean that it might not show up here in the very near future as we... Every now and then we hear rumors that uh, that the new government might invite Frontex. Um, I don't know. We we always just assume that the previous government did not actually want anyone interfering with the way they deal with the things at the border. But this was our interpretation of why the Frontex wasn't here, uh, because at the same time, actually, the main quarter uh, headquarters of Frontex are in Warsaw. Uh, so. It is quite ironic that they're they're not yet present at the border here, um, but yeah, I I really, I mean, just I, you know, replacing the out like you know Polish authorities here with or with with Frontex or Frontex support here, like would mean just as many violations of human rights uh, as we have now, uh, or more, as we see on other, uh, as you mentioned, other uh, for, or other migration routes. Oh. So the border fence is only a few years old, right? And it doesn't expand the whole Polish border. Um, somebody also told me, or I think maybe I read it, that the, that the British government had helped to pay for part of the border wall installation um, and for me, it it made me think it's interesting that there's like this is the approach that like they're not doing it out of some sort of love necessarily for the Polish nation, but 
uh, to create as many barriers mm -hmm. to stop people from coming to the UK where the there's a you know the GDP the GDP there is much higher mm -hmm. than a lot of other countries in Europe and and such but um, yeah I don't know if you have any commentary on like countries on the periphery of the border of of the the EU um, being having the responsibility of uh, watching the border being put on those governments and the way that that en ends up getting enacted on a person-to-person -person level with people crossing the border. Um, like I know the, like certain of the Mediterranean border states will, you know, will put it on, will pay off Libyan Coast Guard mm -hmm. to, you know, very dangerously pull be people back or push people back. Um, Maybe if that's not an interesting question, I don't. It's not even like a fully <laughs> made-up question. I'm not sure if I got the uh, question. <laughs> I guess the question. Yeah, if we think, what what is other countries support and what what's happening here, yeah, or in the way that the border is shaped here? I mean, it has. It's like a buffer. Yeah, I mean, we know and like. We, well, like kind of observing the the general uh, at, you know atmosphere and the tendencies and, and the rest of Europe with the you know far right uh, rising, but just the European policies uh, on migration, right? Talking about like PAC that was recently introduced, or the, the you know including these ideas of externalization um, of migration. Uh, like it it is it is quite obvious that the. The Polish government, the previous one and the new one, uh, would not be able to to do what they do uh, to people on the move on this border if it wasn't with you know done with the silent support of the rest of European Union. And this is you know we we've seen um, other European countries uh, speaking out uh, very uh, loudly uh, when it came to the previous government uh, violating women's rights, for example, or introducing new laws regarding uh, abortion or, um, you know, some laws regarding climate. So then then we've heard, right, like the backlash from, from other European countries and uh, the calls on Polish government you know, not to turn into one of the uh, regimes, etc., etc. But uh, eh, you know, but when crisis of the Polish-Belarusian border started in 2021, uh, there was no such strong reaction. Uh, instead, like you know, we know that it's very much in line with the general um, attitude towards migration and the and the in Europe. Yeah, so. I mean, of course, you know, the Polish government is responsible for the way how they behave, but we need to see changes in the, in the, on a European level in general. Uh, otherwise, nothing will change here. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. I know the kind of pain you're feeling, Alex. I once had it myself. You some kind of doctor? No, Alex. I am Magneto, and I have come to offer you sanctuary. Hello, this is our jingle for our podcast, The Grounded Futures Show. This is the show where we discuss topics ranging from climate change to identity to how youth can gain new skills to thrive amid current and ongoing disasters that we are collectively facing. We are your hosts, one Gen Z Liam and one Gen X Carla. And we think we all deserve to thrive now and not in some distant utopian future. Yeah, but that's in the future. Oh, I hate the future. Yeah, we're with Bolin. Grounded Futures is a larger project, so check that out over at groundedfutures.com. If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce, 
from each interview. Consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibraPay. Or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf slash support. So I heard that um, China and Belarus just ended some um, military exercises on the other side of the border. Um, there's obviously a lot of tension between countries that are aligned with... Well, there's a lot of people that came from Belarus to escape the Lukashenko regime um, after the uprisings. Uh, and also, there's a lot of tension around the war in Ukraine. Um, this region has had an increase in militarization um, and just some sort of order I heard of... of tens of thousands of troops going to be coming here to quote unquote secure the border. Mm -hmm. People that I've talked to in different parts of Poland have been talking about um, it feeling like war is coming between Poland or between Europe or between NATO and some of the countries across, across the border from here. Um, can you talk about how you experienced the, the militarization um, further increasing the danger for people on the move in the forest and also the impacts on the communities that live in the border? Mm. You want? <laughs> I, I, I can <laughs> start so you okay, and then you fill in. <laughs> uh, you mean the, the, how increased militarization and securitization of the border uh, influence? I mean, Yes, of course. I mean, the reason, like, you know, the previous government. Th this was the main strategy of the previous government, right? To, to portray migrants as this tool in Lukashenko's war uh, against Poland. And we hoped, right, naively, we hoped that with the change uh, of government last year, that at least, you know, I don't think we were that naive to to believe that the situation will improve. But at least we. That, you know, but we didn't expect it to de deteriorate, and it really did in the recent months. And we just see that the new government is really continuing the same methods, the same uh, strategy as the previous one, which is, you know, to rule through uh, evo evoking fear in the society. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. Uh, it, it's easy to do so because Polish. I believe that you know a big part of Polish society is uh, scared and is worried because of what's happening in Ukraine, right? Which is very close, and it's very easy to to portray Belarus and Russia as a huge uh, threat uh, when you see what's happening in Ukraine. So, but this narrative of hybrid war that this new government is uh, you know pushing for, for me, it feels like it has nothing to do really with the real threat or to, to you know, the real threat that, that, you know, Polish society might face. And, and this uh, military, like increased militarization and as well as defense that was built, but now the plans for, you know, even like, uh, you know, adding, they're, they're planning to basic, basically even more reinforce this fence, right? Like, for, for us, it's very obvious that it has nothing to do, actually, with the security on this border. Because what we see that it does in practice, it just increases violence and aggression towards people on the move. And I really do not see how, vi uh, you know, violent practices like pushbacks, but also beatings, uh, torture, spraying with tear gas, um, and basically, you know, catching and pushing people back to Belarus, I don't see how in any way it increases anyone's safety. Uh, not to mention that in general I'm, you know, strongly against uh, violating the rights of anybody like this. But, it, you know, it's, it's almost absurd to talk about security. For us it's very, very clear that uh, you know, security is, is a basic human right for everyone. So if we want to talk about security uh, at this border or in this region, we, we have to talk about, you know, security for all of the people, including uh, people on the move who, who are looking for safety and protection here. And it has huge repercussions for them. We've seen, uh, we've seen a big increase in the aggression of um, Polish uh, you know, authorities against uh, migrants, 
and refugees. And just last week, last week, there was a new regulation introduced in part of Parliament, and it's uh, next week there is uh, the next stage of uh, of introducing it, which basically gives complete impunity to Polish authorities to use. Uh, uh, to use weapons and uh, shoot to people, in fact, shoot to people, claiming uh, the, the right to self-defense, but with no legal repercussions, uh, meaning like no, you know, no proper transparent investigation, uh, whether the means used were absolutely necessary. So, you know, simplifying it, it just basically gives uh, complete impunity and the right uh, for for Polish uh, authorities, military, border guards, police to, to shoot people. And we really fear that, you know, the main victims will be will be people on the move. And actually, if it comes to security, actually, uh, this practice of pushback is totally against providing the security, yes, because uh, well, there are some people who enter here, we push them back, some of them, they lose their lives, but the great majority of them, sooner or late, maybe after a second or fifth or fifteenth trial, they finally manage to go through and disappear somewhere, yeah? So they reach their destination countries without any control, without any registration, yes? So if we wanted to have this control and to be aware who is coming, where they are going, who they are, these people, we would just need to apply the existing procedures, the asylum procedure or a return procedure, because applying these procedures give us possibility to check these people, yes, to, to have a control. Only this. <laughs> Uh, and we are not doing this. And if we are not doing this and applying pushbacks, then we we'll totally lose control. So it's really, I mean, the government, they, they talk so much about the security, but they are, what they are doing is actually uh, totally the opposite of, uh, of uh, guaranteeing the country, the citizens, the, the, the basic uh, security. When it uh, comes to migration issues, yeah? because if we talk about the uh, security in a, in a, in a large uh, um, scale, like talking about the, 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 the possible threats from, from other countries, etc., this is a completely different topic. And what's happening here in the border area uh, as a response to, to to this humanitarian crisis, it has nothing in common with uh, with 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 these possible war threats, which we don't want to deny. Yeah, it's just not our expertise. Yes, uh, uh, th 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 this is not something that it, that that uh, it, it probably exists, and the people have right to uh, to to fear about it, but uh, but. Uh, but the government's response has nothing in common with protecting us from a, from a possible war threat. I mean, I think we can also be very blunt and clear about this. I mean, government's response, but also the this technique and means in which they create this fear mm -hmm. against migrants in the society is purely and solely rooted in the racism. Because if we were really talking about uh, you know, um, I mean, they basically portray people on the move as the threat, as the tool to destabilize the nation. This is what we hear, right, from people that uh, these, these big numbers of people will destabilize Europe. What does it mean? Like, people do not destabilize Europe. Like, just people with different, you know, uh, skin color, different origin, different nationality, religious beliefs, or whatever, like, they do not necessarily destabilize anything. And if we talk about I can also respect, and I think it's also important not to undermine the fear in the society of, uh, you know, uh, you know, against the Belarusian and Russian regime. If we do it, we lose kind of this connection and dialogue with the society. But uh, the perfect example of of the fact that it's not the people that are the problem is the Ukrainian border, right? Through which we 
oh, was that was open uh, the first uh, few months of full-scale invasion and two million people from Ukraine uh, came to Poland and somehow the country is still standing like and and actually it was I mean it was a very heartbreaking moment I think here not only because of what was happening in Ukraine and to Ukrainian people when the full-scale invasion started but also because it was very clear um, that the treatment of uh, refugees uh, from Ukraine and refugees from other countries around the world is just so so different but Poland like Polish society then showed that they were really able to give shelter to everyone to give transport to everyone to uh, you know find food uh, to to organize collectively to to do every uh, to, to create this network of support and even on on the you know government level and the legislation level even though the response was slow at the beginning like there were also so many new uh, regulations introduced really fast that actually like showed that it's possible to provide like the support some financial support or uh, to, uh, to to refugees from Ukraine that are not really given to uh, refugees from other countries and this uh, uh, these detention centers are a very good example of this, right? Where, you know, people from Ukraine crossing the border were not <laughs> immediately directed to the closed detention centers, obviously because there is no need to do so. But why then are are people coming through this border uh, directed there? And I think we all know that the, the answer is racism. Could you talk a little bit about repression of human rights activists on the border? I've heard that some people are facing charges mm. for giving aid. Mm. Yeah, humanitarian help is legal. And actually we have in Polish law the obligation to uh, help uh, people in a critical situation. So if there is somebody who needs help and we have means to help them but we don't do that, we could be punished. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, yes, as, as those who provide um, people on the move with humanitarian help, we sometimes face uh, um, problems and accusations. So since the beginning of the crisis, the border guards and the politicians uh, did their best to present us as smugglers or as those who collaborate with smugglers or at least uh, those who help people with the illegal stay. So there are different moments. There are some moments when it's a bit easier for us to work and they just don't pay attention. But at some points, and it's usually in the moments when for some political reasons they they need to show off somehow how effective they are in, um, in dealing with, uh, with this uh, with this irregular irregular border crossing and uh, yeah so so in some in some moments they uh, they really like pay more attention and they try to intimidate us to make us fear or to tire us you know like uh, we have, fortunately, we have only a few uh, very severe cases where people are accused of, uh, of smuggling people only for providing humanitarian help. But we have quite many uh, smaller cases. And yes, as I said, so we, we feel the reason is to to intimidate us, to tire us, to... to We've had some very absurd cases yeah. together. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, you can talk about it if you want. <laughs> but that would be a long story. <laughs> <laughs> so many times. So. Yeah, yeah. So it's like maybe yes, maybe not entering into details. It's like uh, you know, sometimes they they invite you for a, for a, for interrogation as a witness, but after five minutes you start to understand that uh, actually you are heard as a suspect and not as a witness uh, in the case, and uh, they find all possible ways to. Uh, to to make you believe that uh, you are helping smugglers or that you are doing something illegal, which is not true, and we know that. But yes, for some of us, it's really like psychologically, it uh, it's sometimes difficult to 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 face it, um, especially if it uh, if it's constantly uh, repeating. Yeah. 
And this is, yes, this is, this is a kind of uh, repression techniques as well, to, to tire people, to intimidate them, to, to make them believe uh, at the end of the day that maybe there is something wrong about what they are doing. Yeah. Most of the time they're absurd, but then, mm-hmm. you know, over the time some, some of those accusations accumulate and some people do face more serious risks and we had cases of the activist bases being raided or people's houses a uh, few many cases of phones including mine <laughs> you know my phone was taken by border guards once um, when we were uh, interrogated yeah. as witnesses by the way <laughs> yes we were both interrogated as witnesses and at the end of well, I was actually invited mm-hmm. uh, not really invited but mm-hmm. I went to the border guards office uh, to Uh, make sure that the procedures regarding one man from Syria that wanted to apply for international protections were followed correctly. And because I had his power of attorney, I, I went there and they invited me, uh, you know, to one of the rooms saying that this is where his pro- procedures are taking place. When I entered the room, they closed the door behind me and it was very clear that it's just me and the border guards uh, officer who, is, who said that, okay, let's begin the interrogation. And I was like, oh, hold on a second. I don't remember <laughs> coming here for interrogation. And luckily that time, because we have this amazing, amazing lawyers collective that supports us, I actually managed to, to sneak out of the room because I said that, okay, I have the right to, to contact someone. Uh, and I called them and they were like, no, like just, you know, you can say that you want to get out of there. They have to give you the official, inform- you know, official invite for the interrogation. So, i don't think I even had the exact, uh, uh, you know, legal basis to to claim that I shouldn't be there. But I was so, <laughs> with the support of this collective, I felt so empowered that I was like, no way, I'm leaving now. And they let me go. So. <laughs> But then a week later, they took away my phone. So, and they found a way eventually. Uh, hopefully, but uh, hopefully they never managed to actually see what's inside. Uh, but yeah, there are many of such cases and it is, and you know, we also, that was another thing that we really hoped that it, this would change with the old government. And now we hear the new government doing exactly the same thing. And again, positioning us as some sort of a threat to Polish security or collaborators with the, you know, Belarusian regime. And it's really tiring and annoying that instead of focusing on like proper issues in Poland, right? Like with integration of uh, migrants and refugees and, um, mm, you know, all of all of the things that are actually needed, they, they focus on this. Um, and it's sad that they're doing this and it's sad to see, you know, some of the officials that a few years ago were strongly supporting human rights um, now uh, following the same, the same narrative. But uh, yeah, it is what it is. Or now. Like, could you name some groups and their websites, if you can think of, that people could either learn more about this subject from or offer aid if they're far away from the border, but maybe have some money that they want to kick in for battery banks or raincoats or whatever? Uh, there are quite a few. I think uh, for your listeners, there is uh, NBT, No Borders Team that's uh, active, um, as well as the collective, best collective. Uh, um, and then also there is uh, social media of Grupa Granica, border group, that uh, you can also find information on how to do- donate money, mainly through Sklep Bez Granic, shop, which is Shop Without Borders, uh, where you can actually like choose uh, more or less what are the items. Um, that you could donate money to, uh, like either, you know, the food package or the um, hygiene uh, kit or, or psychological help for someone, you know, you can, you can choose and donate the equivalent of, of that uh, to the shop. Mm, but we also try to go and are, uh, we try to be present during some more alternative events where you can uh, we try to talk directly to people and uh, spread information about what's happening at this border so last year a lot of uh, 
activists from Grupa Granica were going to different no borders camps in Europe. Uh, um, so you can, you know, you can also check. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't know if we managed to spread to US. But we do have some volunteers uh, even coming from mm -hmm. the US uh, to volunteer at our base. Um, and this is also great to, to exchange these experiences. So this is also always an option to, to contact us and actually come and, uh, and join the efforts. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that I didn't ask about that you want to mention? Any like burning thought that you want folks mm -hmm. in the listening audience to to hear? Oh, I told about pushback violence. I always feel like we never talk about the positive stories uh, mm -hmm. at all, but it's hard to think of them. <laughs> no, that maybe for another. <laughs> I mean, are there any? Well, yeah, maybe there's not yeah. time, but yeah. like any examples of of people that you've met passing through the forest that are now... I always talk mm -hmm. about Zuzia. Zu, uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I mean, okay, there are... I think one thing that keeps us going through, uh, you know, because people have this thing that, you know, it's hard and depressing. Yes, there are so many heartbreaking stories and to see people who experience this violence and this, you know, unfair, violent treatment um, it's hard, but on the other hand, to see the strength and resilience of people who, you know, people on the move. Uh, so many people in this world, you know, have to, this is the only way for them to, to, uh, to really uh, fight for the future they want. Um, and to see how many people are so strong and, and uh, brave to, to to go on this journey and, and cross like this, um, this really you know gives you the perspective that what we do here is nothing compared to to even just w crossing this border one time. Um, and we meet amazing people. You know, this is this is what happens when you let go of the fear of the other, and instead you you know you're more open to. Of course, we we pr provide help to anyone regardless of who they are or how they are. But for sure, the this you know one amazing side of this is that we get to meet so many incredible amazing people uh, in the forest and i remember this one story where last year in the middle of really dangerous swamps uh, we got the call for intervention to to a young uh, woman from somalia uh, she was alone um, and i remember that when we saw, you know, it took us hours to get to her. It was really, we had to cross a river and a really, really dangerous, uh, like old swamps uh, where we, the, we ourselves, me and my friend, got into the mud until our, our waist and could barely really get out. And then we were really exhausted. But then when we finally reached the location, we saw her just holding onto a tree on this like little island of, mm. of soil. Uh, in the middle of really, really difficult, horrible swamps. So we just both rushed to her through this water and mud and immediately hugged her, even, you know, even though that's not something we always do, but, you know, she just looked like it was such a dangerous spot that... Um, so we hugged her and we we're like, oh my God, like, okay, we have to at least get you out of the swamp to the, to the dry ground, right? Like, like you can't leave anyone in that. It's a clear threat to their life. Uh, I don't think it would be possible for her to get out of there by herself. So we decided to get outside of the swamp and it was really hard because she spent days in forest alone. She was dehydrated. She didn't eat for days. She was exhausted. Her entire body was... In, in pain, every like you could see that every move, every step, like hurt her so much. So you know, every step took, and every step meant like you know, falling inside mud until your knee or thigh. So every step was required so much strength, and both of us pulling each other, like three of us actually pulling each other from the mud. So we were, it was a really slow process. And I thought that, oh my God, we're gonna spend ages. Like we're, we're never gonna get out of here. We're gonna spend ages here. Uh, and took us, you know, like two hours to, to move even like 50, not even 50 meters. So I was like, okay, 
but then at some like and we were almost you know losing energy me and my friend and then this young uh, Somali girl she she started motivating herself and this was something like really heartwarming where she started talking to herself she was like okay you can do it you've came this far you can you can keep going you know your family always believed in you you're the bravest of your siblings you can do it <laughs> so it was really really like oh, and she started and you could see that the strength coming back to her and she started picking up the pace and like and and walking i was like okay okay there is a chance we will get out of here and suddenly three of us fell into even deeper swamp until our waist and i was like oh no we're all gonna cry again <laughs> and, uh, and the nightmare will start. And I remember I turned back and looked at her standing in the mud until her waist. And she looked at me and she said, oh my mud. <laughs> 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 and we started laughing so hard. And then, you know, a little, a little bit more time and we got out of the swamp. And so for me, you know, she's one of the bravest person I've ever met, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, it's stories like this that you think it's all of this is worth worth it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks a lot for having the conversation. The work that you mm. do. No, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you for coming here. Yeah, yeah. Oh. sure. The final straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Are you tired of listening to Western experts talking how the world works? Is another portion of liberal analysis of the uprising makes you fall asleep? Well, then check Elephant in the Room, an anarchist radio show from the European Dresden, where we interview activists who are participating in struggles around the world. Elephant in the Room is a proud member of Channel Zero Network. You can find our show on your favorite podcast platforms, CZN website, or somewhere on the internet. From activists for activists. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. I got a food box last week and I need to tell you about my Mexican Velveeta. I know. You're expecting me to weigh in on Biden stepping down and what happens next as fascism looms over our world like the shadow of the Death Star. But I think we know by now that the illusion of freedom has been stripped away and the whole political process is a sham. So, my food box, my Mexican Velveeta. Here at the Super Duper Max, I can receive one food box and one clothes box per year. It used to be that my mom could go shopping and send me the box full of like 25 pounds of food, pretty much whatever I wanted. But then these predatory profiteers swooped in, access secure pack, union supply, and walking horse mail-order companies who formed a kind of triopoly. So now friends and family must order the boxes from one of these three price-gouging corporations. Anyway, I got with Adam Bomb and he ordered the food box. My food box doesn't look like most other prisoners' food boxes. Most everyone else loads their boxes with candy bars and chips that are otherwise unavailable to us, exotic and exclusive items. My next-door neighbor, BP, is a big fan of Reese's, stocks up on every Reese's item in the catalog. Personally, I'm not a candy and chip guy. I stock up on oatmeal, raisin bran, and condiments that can be, that can be used to make other food taste better, like spicy garlic parmesan sauce. I max out on those. But the principal centerpiece of any of my food boxes is Mexican Velveeta. I get the max, 80 ounces, and that's really what I want to talk about. Before now, I never really interrogated my Mexican Velveeta. I just ate it. I would slice it up, lay the slices over hot food, and let it melt, then consume. And by the way, I eat like an absolute barbarian. I just shovel food into my face. I'm a social embarrassment. Anyway, I never pondered the existential questions swirling around my Mexican Velveeta until now. I had to ask myself, what makes this Mexican? I have friends who are Mexican. My friend Juan Soto is Mexican, and I know what makes him Mexican. He came from Mexico. So I wondered, 
Does my Mexican Velveeta come from Mexico like Juan Soto does? I checked out the box. First, you should know Velveeta is not cheese. It is artificial cheese food product, a facsimile of cheese, it seems. And when I examined the box of my artificial cheese food product, I didn't see anything in Spanish. Everything was written in English, a good sign that this artificial cheese food product did not come from Juan Soto's homeland. I also read the ingredients. I'll share those with you. Skin milk, milk, canola oil, milk protein concentrate, whey, sodium phosphate, modified food starch. All other ingredients were less than 2%. Now, I'm no expert on these food ingredients, but unless Mexico has some kind of exclusive sodium phosphate mine that I've never heard of, it seems to me that all of these ingredients likely originate from right here. There's nothing Mexican about them. I also noted the address of the parent company is Chicago, not Mexico City or Juarez. I think we can be pretty certain that this box of Mexican Velveeta and all of its ingredients never ventured south of the border. So what makes this artificial cheese food product Mexican? I pondered that maybe it was Mexican by virtue of the recipe being something inherently Mexican. You know, like Mexican food at a restaurant in the U.S. It's the recipe. Now, I'm no expert on Mesoamerica, so all of this is just guesswork. But I can't imagine the Mayans, pre-conquest, eating artificial cheese food products. And I can't imagine that the Spanish conquistadors who came to colonize brought artificial cheese food product on the boats with them. I'm pretty sure that we can rule out any chance that my Mexican Velveeta is Mexican because of the recipe. It could be, of course, that what is implied by Mexican is that when you eat it, you are reminded of Mexico or the idea of Mexico. It could be that simple, right? Well, let me tell you, I've never eaten Mexico. I've had a pretty big appetite, but never that big. I can't imagine eating Mexico, and I don't recommend you try it either. I don't think that would work out well for you or for Mexico. But on a smaller scale, a bite of this artificial cheese food product does not in any way make me contemplate the same flavor profile I would imagine from taking a bite of Mexico, any part of Mexico. Not that I would eat Mexico, but you get what I'm saying. I asked my friend Juan Soto if the flavor profile of Mexican Velveeta reminds him of his homeland. He responded, na 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 you're a racist. I'll take that as a no. So here we are at the end of a thorough and exhaustive investigation into my Mexican Velveeta, and I have to conclude that there is no rational nor reasonable justification for the word Mexican to be on the box. I'm beginning to suspect that the Kraft Heinz Food Company is being less than forthright in the labeling of their artificial cheese food product. Just to be clear, I'm not dissatisfied with the fake cheese. I'm not even necessarily offended by their cultural appropriation. I think I'm sort of annoyed at their failure to culturally appropriate. It's like they made a half-hearted effort to culturally appropriate and didn't even do a good job at it. Or, more accurately, they attempted to culturally project the opposite of cultural appropriation, projecting something into a culture where it doesn't even belong. So while I eat my food box, if anyone out there wants to call out Velveeta for being so lazy in their cultural projection slash appropriation, you can go to Velveeta.com or call them at 1-800-634-1984. It's a toll-free call. If you call, demand that they get a translator so someone you know can cuss them out in Spanish or in Cohuatl, one of the indigenous languages from the area that is now Mexico. Perhaps we can shame them into donating a thousand tons of artificial cheese food product to the Zapatistas or something. Or hire my dude Juan as a cultural projection inspector, even if he did call me a racist. 
This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop.